Hello, I'm William Harris, Deputy Director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library Museum. On a beautiful morning like this, it is easy to understand why President Roosevelt loved the Hudson Valley. I am again on the library grounds, and I want to focus on the often unnoticed evidence and unique details of our landscape. The library is situated on a 16-acre tract of land adjacent to the Roosevelt home, Springwood. This land was transferred to the federal government in 1939 for construction of the nation's first presidential library operated by the National Archives and Records Administration. Take the library gatehouse behind me. It stands at the old entrance to the library grounds on Route 9. Like the library, it is built in the Dutch colonial style favored by FDR. This little building was actually a gift to the president. He had envisioned a gatehouse here all along but the president considered the cost estimate too high. Instead, he decided that a wooden kiosk would do for tickets, along with a planned parking lot nearby. However, the construction contractor, John McShane, had another idea. Shortly after the library opened to the public in 1941, McShane offered to build the gatehouse for the sum of $1. The president gladly accepted, and it was completed before the end of the year. Correspondence in our collection reveals the pride McShane felt in doing this for the president. The gatehouse would soon become more than merely an architectural feature. With the onset of World War II, the gatehouse became the on-site headquarters for the 240th Military Police Battalion. This detachment was charged with protecting the president and his estate. They patrolled the grounds throughout the war. The Gatehouse serves as a reminder of their essential service and patriotism. They remained on site here until shortly after the President's death in 1945. But the Gatehouse was only one security feature on library and estate property. Just to the south, along the old main entrance road to Springwood, now operated by the National Park Service, we can see remnants of another protective feature. Two easily unnoticed metal fittings are all that remain here of crash wires. These wires, along with a system of electronic eyes, were tied to a system of electric switches to trigger alarms if breached. They were placed at various access points around the estate. As a side note, revealing the importance of preserving these reminders of another era, the fittings were forged by the Stockham Company of Birmingham, Alabama. Like many firms from down south and across the country, Stockholm was impacted by Executive Order 8802, signed by FDR in 1941, which mandated that all federal defense contracts include language barring discrimination on the basis of race, creed, or national origin. This undistinguished metal rail fence borders the south and west boundaries of library property. The fence once traced the northern property line as well, FDR mandated its construction. Before the home and grounds became National Park Service property, the fence served as a dividing line between federal land and the private Springwood estate. FDR wanted a visual marker to keep sightseers from nosing around his property without buying a museum ticket. The north and west boundaries of the library evidenced the president's desire to retain the original character of the property to the fullest extent possible. An apple orchard stands along the north side, and the line of trees and the stone wall on the eastern edge of the property are little changed from 1941. Before development across Route 9 from the library, a picturesque canopy of limbs and leaves shaded the road, and photos show the rural character of the area. Just a few hundred feet from the current entrance to the library and home site, President Roosevelt also maintained about 400 acres of his estate as a tree plantation. He even dubbed himself a tree farmer each time he voted. He had a keen interest in forestry. Sound forest management ensured healthy woodlands and provided income for the estate through timber harvest. FDR even started a Christmas tree farm near here. It is hard to imagine today, but the president considered Christmas trees as a money-making endeavor. He sold them to the major department stores in New York City, such as Macy's and Gimbel's, under his brand and kept careful records of monies made. He also gifted them. In 1943, he gave one to the library and another was shipped to Great Britain as a gift to Prime Minister Churchill.
Finally, I'd like to focus on the pasture. It long served as a source of hay for the estate. To this day, it is hayed annually. When the home opened in 1946, the pasture became a mini dust bowl as it became a parking lot for thousands of cars. Former President Lyndon Johnson even landed here by helicopter. But mostly, it is a peaceful reminder of the farmland FDR once roamed as a child or raced across in his hand-controlled Ford, terrifying his passengers. Thank you again for joining me on the library grounds for another brief tour. And the next time you drive past or visit the grounds, take a closer look and assume that everything you see has a story about President Roosevelt's life and career, yes, but also about our roles in honoring and preserving this place for generations to come. For more information about the library, please visit fdrlibrary.org and about the National Archives at archives.gov. <laughs>